something that you are hopefully noticing, and uh, I'm doing my very best to communicate it, so if you're not noticing it, I'm not doing my job, um, not even just my job, my passion, and that is that uh, what we're seeing is, is that we're adding things slowly to the table of truth, uh, things, for example, such as creation. In our last presentation, we talked about the law and justice and, and uh, other sort of biblical ideas and doctrines are making their way onto the table of truth, but every one of them is saturated with the basic picture of who God is. Is that coming clear? Right? We don't just want some you know, anomalous, novel, religious idea that just makes its way under the table but is somehow disconnected or is in any way disconnected from the central truth about who God is. And there's too much religion that's that way, frankly. There are too many little idiosyncratic, cultural, personal things that, that we do in our religious life. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. The problem emerges when we take those little beliefs or perspectives or even opinions that we have and then we make them normative or standards for other people. No, 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 no. What we want is biblical truth, right? We just want to know what the truth is. And your own particular way of doing that in your church or your country or your culture or your family, whatever, hey, that is going to be largely up to you within the realms of reason. But outside of that, let's just see what the biblical data is, yeah? and try to divorce it from all of this other cultural and personal and opinion you know, clutter that gets on the table of truth. And we have a hard time distinguishing between what the message really is. And the message is a beautiful message of peace. In fact, the Bible repeatedly refers to God as the God of peace. When Jesus uh, is announced in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verses uh, 6, 7, and 8, He is called the Prince of Peace. And so we, we want a message that is beautiful, that's biblical, that's saturated in the love of God, and a message that announces to us who God is. And God is a God of peace. He longs to make peace with humanity. In fact, Scripture, this teaching of Scripture, is that God has made peace with humanity in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now that's what we're going to talk about right now. We're going to ask the somewhat provocative question, who killed Jesus? Uh, and in order to do that, I just want you to know right up front that this is a fairly dense presentation. Um, if you're sitting there thinking, did he just call me dense? No, <laughs> didn't call you dense. The presentation is dense. In other words, there's a lot of data here, and it's going to require your, your attentiveness. You're going to really kind of need to be with me and be in the zone. And uh, we're going to sort of do two things. The presentation's in, in some ways going to be divided up into kind of two parts, so they fit together uh, in a really complementary way. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to sort of ask the question, did Jesus even live? Like, how do we know that a man named Jesus of Nazareth actually lived? Is this just a biblical idea? Is this just a religious idea? Is this an idea of faith? Do I just have to have faith that he lived? Or is there, is there good reason, is there good evidence to think that this guy actually lived, that he actually did the things that the New Testament describes him having done? Uh, then in the second part, we're going to take a look at a biblical prophecy, what's called a messianic prophecy, one of the most remarkable prophecies in all of Scripture, that actually points forward, uh, not just to Jesus in some ambiguous sense or some general sense, but actually points forward to his death. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the implications of his death and who killed him. I mean, who was it that was ultimately responsible for the death of Jesus? And so we're going to sort of accomplish those two things. Uh, by way of beginning, I want to remind us from our last presentation, we were asking the question, will there ever be justice on earth? And we came to the conclusion that the answer is yes, there will be, but it will be in the new heavens and the new earth where it reaches its fullest manifestation of true justice, true righteousness, and true love-based living. But even here on earth, the church, God calls you as a member of, of His church, not a member of this denomination or this denomination or this denomination, but as a member of the church of Jesus Christ. You're a follower of Jesus in your own sphere, within your family, within your neighborhood, within your workplace, at your university. In your own sphere of influence, God calls you to help establish justice on earth by living your life in harmony with the principles of the Messiah the way that Jesus lived his life. And therefore, you become, as it were, a, a tentacle that reaches out, a, a, an antenna that, that reaches out, hands that reach out into the world to establish the Messiah's justice and the Messiah's rule on earth. Jesus repeatedly talked about this, and he called it the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He went so far as on one occasion to say the kingdom of, the, of heaven is, the kingdom of heaven is within you. 
It's not, some ten, it's not a place that you can go. Like, take a left, drive about three miles, you'll go over a hill, there'll be a stoplight, take the right there, and then you'll come to a T, and the kingdom of heaven is on your right. No, it's not like giving directions to a pizza hut or to a Walmart. No, the kingdom of heaven is not a geographical location. The kingdom of heaven emerges wherever someone chooses to live their life with Jesus as the king. Did you get that? The kingdom of heaven is what emerges when you choose to live your life as Jesus, as your king. So you literally can bring the kingdom of heaven to your office. Right? You can bring the kingdom of heaven to your university. You can bring the kingdom of heaven to your neighborhood because if Jesus is your king, Obama might be your president, but Jesus can be your king. Right? For our viewing audience, you might have your president, whether you're in Australia or wherever it is. That, that person might be your prime minister or your president, but Jesus is your king. And when you say, Jesus is my king, you are establishing, when you live that way, by His grace and by His Spirit, you're establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. Amen? I mean, that's the very prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, right? Thy will be done on heaven, or uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. And so this idea of the establishment of the kingdom of heaven, not as a geographical entity, but as a, a relational and beautiful and love-based reality, that's what God calls us to. And in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8, one of my favorite little just short passages of Scripture, God says, For I, the Lord, love... What does He love? Justice. justice. And God asks us to establish justice in our own spheres of influence, in our own homes, in our own families, in our own workplaces, in our own churches, to live the life of justice. Well, let's ask the question. All of this is fine and good and nice, David, and I've been enjoying the presentation, somebody might be saying, from the listening audience. Um, but how do we know that this Jesus guy even lived? I mean, really, how do we, can we be sure? And what I want to try and do at the outset of our presentation here is establish the historicity, the reliability of the historical life of a man named Jesus. Just last night before I was going to bed, I got sucked into the YouTube vortex. Does that ever happen to you? You know, someone sends you a link that's actually something that you might want to be interested in. So you go and you watch it. Oh, that was interesting. And then it's like... Oh, well, that looks interesting. Click, 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 click. And somehow, I don't know what it was that I was clicking on, but I ended up um, watching um, a 25-minute documentary on a man in Siberia, I think his name is Vissarion, who claims to be Jesus, and uh, the third uh, manifestation of Jesus. He's Russian, and in the taiga forest there of Siberia, uh, he has like 10,000 followers, and uh, it's, it's, it's really very kind of creepy and kind of cultic and kind of strange, and and uh, not surprisingly, I suppose, Vissarion is clothed in white. You know, what else would a Messianic figure uh, be clothed in? He's got a beard, the requisite beard, and the long hair. So he's very Christ-like in terms of just the way he looks and the way he's acting. And uh, in the sort of... Um, she'll be all right. She'll be all right. Just take her outside, give her a bit of a talking to. Um <laughs> You know, I can't understand why a two-year-old would not want to sit through my presentation. <laughs> um, so anyway, Vasarian is, is whoever he is, I, th I think I'm saying his name right, is sort of like this Messiah figure, this Christ figure. And the truth of the matter is, is that we live in a time where there is no shortage of people who view themselves as Christ figures or Messiah figures or religious leaders. And uh, what I want to talk about is the original Messiah, the, the one who came 2,000 years ago, who lived uh, in and around uh, Palestine, and can we be sure that this guy actually existed? I mean, how do we know that anything in history actually happened? And I'll just maybe say a brief thing on that. As soon as you get, one, as soon as you get more than a single generation removed from any historical event, we are trusting the historians to tell us the truth. This is a basic philosophy of history. Say, so take, for example, the Civil War, uh, the United States Civil War, the American Civil War. There is no one on earth that witnessed those events, no one that's presently alive that saw those events with his or her own eyes. And so what we do is we rely upon the historical accounts. And historians have a variety of criteria by which they establish veracity and authenticity, etc. And uh, so too, uh, as, we get as, as we get further and further removed from history, it gets harder and harder to discern exactly what the historical facts are. And so it's very interesting with regards to the case of, of Jesus. 
Some people are of the persuasion or of the opinion that all that we know about Jesus is contained in the Bible. And uh, you just have to take the Bible on faith, some sort of fuzzy, wuzzy, you know, like, yeah, I feel in my heart it's true. Um, well, I'm not suggesting that you don't feel in your heart that it's true. I think that's an appropriate response. But fortunately for us, there is very good historical evidence, like the kind of historical evidence that historians look at and say, yeah, that's solid. Yeah, that is almost certainly the case. And then when you have multiple what's called attestation, basically attestings, you have, you have multiple historical, extra-biblical, outside of the Bible, historical attestations of a man named Jesus who lived at about this time, who did about these things, who lived this kind of a life. And when those attestations are largely consistent and congruent, a historian looks at that and says, that's a historical fact. And I want to give you some of those extra-biblical attestations about uh, the life of a man named Jesus so that we can first talk about, did the guy even live? Before we can ask the second question, um, who killed him? And so I want to start by just making a very simple point, an important point, and that is that th the question, did Jesus actually live, is a, is a critically important one because the Christian faith is an historical faith. It's what, everyone? Historical. It's a historical faith. What that means is, well, let me just read it and then I'll tell you what it means. That is, it is a faith that is grounded in certain events having actually happened. If those events did not, in fact, happen, the Christian faith is not true. Okay, now here's kind of the point. In this sense, the Christian faith is a very vulnerable faith. Now hear me out on this. Because the, Christian, because the, the story of Christ and the basic message of Christianity is rooted in an historical figure and in historical events, namely the life, death, and resurrection of this figure, if those things could be shown to be historically inaccurate or historically unreliable, then Christianity can be on shaky ground. By the way, the Apostle Paul makes this very point in Scripture. He says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then your faith is empty, it's futile, it's vain, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So in this sense, you can just imagine that Christianity, as it were, places its head on the chopping block. Like it is... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It is vulnerable to falsification. If it could be shown that the man named Jesus really didn't exist or that, that, that the man that, that Jesus that did exist was nothing like the biblical picture that we see in Scripture, that the Christian faith here could literally be chopped off at the head, quite literally, um, because Christ is the head. Um, so, so the point here that I want you to really appreciate is if you take other religious faiths and I'm not going to list them here um, as such. But there are other historical faiths that are other uh, religious faiths, excuse me, that just make like philosophical, theological claims about the nature of reality. And whether or not, well, let's just take Buddha, for example. Whether or not Gautama Buddha ever lived or existed does not, would not detract from the truthfulness of what the Buddhist believes about his sayings. You pick up on that? In other words, if it was somebody else that said it, the saying is where the locus of truth is. But Jesus is different than this. Because if Jesus, Jesus made wild claims, and the claims that he made about himself and about his mission were rooted in his death, burial, and resurrection. He said things like this. You destroy this temple in three days, and I'll raise it up again. Right? You destroy the, and the, and the Jews were like, are you kidding? It took 46 years to build this temple. How could you possibly? Be? But what he was saying is, my claims, my healings are, are the extension of the kingdom of God on earth. And, and I will give you evidence of that. Not only the evidence of the healings, not only the evidence of my sayings and the truthfulness of them, but, but when I'm raised from the dead, you will know that the things that I have said are true. Right? So Jesus himself, as well as Paul, rooted the, the truthfulness of what he was saying in his actual historicity and in his, of course, the historicity of his resurrection, because that's what sets him apart from everybody else. Millions and billions of people have died, but the question is, did this guy actually raise from the dead? Well, before we can ever get to that question, we need to ask the first question, did he live in the first place? And the answer is, in fact, he did. And I want to spend just a little bit of time here going through some of these extra-biblical evidences. The first is from a very interesting letter that we have from a man that we simply know as Mara Bar Serapion. And uh, the letter was written sometime around 70 to 100 A.D., A.D. 70 to 100. And uh, we don't know very much about him. I'm just going to read you a small portion of this letter that we have. But apparently, 
uh, Marabar Serapion is writing this letter from prison. And uh, he feels that he has been unjustly prisoned. And he actually uses three examples of other people in history who have been unjustly treated or, or, or unjustly imprisoned. And uh, one of those examples that he uses is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the significance of, here, uh, of this again here is just listen to the date on this. This is like circa 100 A.D. or A.D. 100. Right? So this is contemporaneous with Jesus. That means that it couldn't have been some later invention, you know, third and fourth century, somebody made up this idea of a Jesus figure, a Christ figure. No, very interesting. Look at what he says. He's writing and he says, What advantage did the Athenians gain by murdering Socrates, for which they were repaid with famine and pestilence? Or the people of Samos by the burning of Pythagoras because their country was completely covered in sand in just one hour. He's basically using here Pythagoras and Socrates as two examples of people that were unjustly treated. Then he says, what advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that that their kingdom was abolished. That's an unambiguous reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which we're going to talk a lot about in just a bit. Nor did the wise king die altogether. He lived on in the teaching which he had given, an almost um, a, a veiled reference to the, the concept of the resurrection. So this is a very interesting... Historians look at that and they say, that's fascinating. Because that basic idea is, is a corroboration of the, the basic picture that we have of Scripture here, that a man named Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, that he was executed to some degree by the very people, or at least the religious leaders of the people that he'd actually come to help, but in some sense he didn't actually die, and some movement carried his teachings on. Well, that is basically a fairly accurate synopsis of the New Testament, and it's not being written by anybody with a religious agenda. And so a historian will look at that and say, that, that smells like the truth, right? Here's another one. Uh, Christians derived their name from a man called Christ, who, during the reign of Emperor Tiberius, had been executed by uh, sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. The deadly superstition, that's Christianity, which of course from a Roman uh, perspective, this is Tacitus, uh, Cornelius Tacitus. Notice again here the date, AD 56 to 120, that's when Tacitus lived. So these are almost contemporary figures with Jesus. And just a quick word here about Tacitus. Most of what we know about the Roman Empire of the first century and the, and the preceding centuries comes from Tacitus. Most of the sort of, you know, when you get a picture of what Rome looked like, most of that comes to us from, from Tacitus here. And Tacitus is writing about Jesus, and he says, and Christianity, the deadly superstition, which of course it was regarded as a deadly superstition because it was against the state religion, which at this time in Rome's history was, was emperor worship. Okay, well later actually wasn't quite emperor worship yet, but it was about ready to become. Uh, da, 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 da. The deadly superstition thus checked for the moment broke out afresh, not only in Judea, also now the location is correct, the first source of the evil, but also in the city of Rome. Oh, that squares with what we learn about in Scripture, um, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world meet and become popular. So even Tacitus is not too thrilled about Rome as a city. So notice he says here, Christians derive their name from a man called Christ, and then he tells us when, who during the reign of Emperor Tiberius, and now watch this detail, had been executed by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Now this is hugely significant for historians, because here we have again, this is not a religious writer. He's a, his, a Roman historian who's writing about the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of Roman society. And he says, oh, here's something that was happening during this time, the reign of Tiberius Caesar. There was a man, his name was the Christ. He was in the area of Judea. He was, he was a Jew. He was killed by the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate. And uh, the deadly heresy spread so significantly it even went to Rome. Now, again, that smells a lot like the New Testament picture of Jesus. The timing is right, the basic uh, perspective is right, the, the execution is right, the person responsible for the execution is right. And so when a historian then comes to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the writings of Paul, and they see consistency between that and other historians, they say, yeah, that, that is almost certainly historical facts. Historical what, everyone? Fact. Now, just another quick word on that basic idea. Historians do not treat, as funny as it might seem to some of us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John any differently than they treat any other historian. Because some people would look and say, well, they had an agenda. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had an, had a, an historical and a religious agenda. Well, the truth of the matter is, all historians have agendas. 
right? Even today. And this is why some, someone once quipped that history is only slightly more difficult to tell. What happened in the past is only slightly more difficult to tell than what's going to happen in the future, right? Because, because history is always viewed through the eyes of the person who's writing it, even your own history. I mean, how many times in your, in your own experience have you been just sure that a certain kind of thing happened and then your spouse or your friend or your mom or your dad tells you, no, it was actually different than that. And then now you wonder, am I completely insane? Did that thing actually happen the way I thought it did? Well, no, you're not completely insane. What happened is you filtered that experience, you filtered whatever it was that happened through your own experience and through your own take on it right? And then over time, it can become cloudy, and the thing that you were just sure happened, it might be kind of like what happened, but other people say it actually happened a little different than that, right? And that's just the nature of history. But when you have numerous people who are all saying, no, this is what happened, this is how it happened, this is when it happened, and this is why it happened, okay, now we're arriving at historical truth. Does this help? Is this kind of a bit of a philosophy of history class here? And so, Yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are treated by historians as um, having had an agenda, but Tacitus had an agenda. E every historian has some kind of an agenda, but here's the point. When people with different agendas and different perspectives are giving the same basic facts of the case, now we can be sure we're arriving at the actual thing and not just perception. So far, so good? Okay, here's, this is from another Roman historian, not nearly as well known as Tacitus. His name is Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, and notice AD 69 to 130. He's writing and he says, Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in AD 49. By the way, this is described in the book of Acts. This very event is described in the book of Acts. Now, why? Why did Claudius expel the Jews from Rome? Because of the riots they were causing at the instigation of, and he writes, Crestus. But that's almost certainly a, a Latinization or a Roman misstatement of Christ. Because everything else matches up. The, Rome, the, 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 the Roman um, uh, procurator here, the Roman uh, uh, commander, kicks the Jews out of Rome because there were riots. There was agitation, and it was about this figure, Crestus, which sounds very similar to the Hebrew uh, Christ, which is the anointed one, which is what the word literally means. And so here again is an absolute historical confirmation of something that the text of Scripture says, yeah, that's what happened, that's when it happened, that's why it happened. Um, here's one that I think, well, let me just read it for you here, and I want to make sure I get the person uh, right who said it, but I think it was Lucian of Samosota, but let's see. The one whom they still worship today, the man in Palestine who was crucified, ah, there's a historical consistency, because he brought this new form of initiation into the world. So this idea that he brought in some new idea. Moreover, yeah, Lucian of Samosota, um, who was a Greek uh, play uh, uh, actor and, and uh, satirist, um, moreover, that first lawgiver of theirs persuaded them that they are all brothers. Oh, there's a consistency there. And that the moment they transgress and deny the Greek gods, okay, and begin worshiping that crucified sophist, an unambiguous reference to Jesus Christ, and living by his laws. So here again, we have a, 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 an actor who's not writing from any favorable perspective of Christianity. In fact, he goes so far as to call Jesus a crucified sophist. Right? But the point is, is that it's interesting. The moment he says a crucified sophist, which is obviously a term of derision, he confirms one of the basic historical facts about the man Jesus, namely that he was crucified. Right? He was regarded as you know, a lawgiver by his people. Uh, not only that, um, he taught that people were all brothers, etc. And so again, when a historian begins to see these multiple attestations, these multiple extra-biblical pictures of this Christ figure from people who don't have a particular religious agenda associated with that figure, they begin to say, yeah, the corroboration here, the consistency here, this looks to be very reliable. Uh, and here's, uh, I think, a final one. This one's from Flavius Josephus, who was uh, a Jewish historian. At this time, there appeared what? Jesus, a wise man. Notice the time. He's giving us about the time when this happened. For he was a doer of startling deeds, okay, a, a seeming uh, reference to the miracles, a teacher, that's accurate, of people who received the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following, now watch this, both among Jews and among many of Greek origin. So he had universal appeal, Gentile and Jewish appeal, which is actually what we find in the New Testament. He was perhaps the Messiah Christ, Right? Now, this is an interesting statement here because Josephus, and this is actually somewhat disputed, 
um, because people are saying, why would Josephus, a Jew, actually say that Jesus may have been the Messiah Christ? And there's, you know, sort of half of the scholarly community says that is something that Flavius Josephus likely said, and the other half says, we're not sure he said it. It seems strange. I think he probably said it, because he doesn't say he was the Messiah Christ, and of course, Messiah is just the Hebrew word and Christ, the Greek word for the same thing, the anointed one. He says, he, hey, this guy might have been the Messiah. And when Pilate, us, and now we're at, a correct, uh, chronologi- we're at the correct time, chronologically, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, oh, so now we know the situation that led, the conspiracy that led to his death, condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. In other words, his movement didn't lose steam because of his death goes on to say, for they reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion. Now we have an extra biblical reference to the resurrection and that he was alive. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out. Now, now the point here, and I hope you're beginning to see this, and this is not every historical um, attestation, extra biblical attestation that we could give, but it's, it's some of the most profound. Basically, if we didn't know anything about Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if there was no New Testament, I want this to sink into you, if there was no New Testament, the things that I'm going to write, that I'm going to place here on the screen are the things that we would know about Jesus. Again, even if there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, okay, just based on other extra biblical evidences. We would know that his name was Jesus or Jesus Christ. We would know the place and time of his ministry in Palestine sometime between AD 26 and 36. We would know the name of his mother, Mary. We would know that there was something ambiguous about the nature of his birth, which is exactly what Scripture confirms, that he was born of a woman who had never been with a man, and that that was actually, we see instances in the New Testament where that's suggested, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, his mother, we know who this guy is, as if to suggest that there was something not exactly on the up and up with his birth. And and we know that from extra-biblical sources as well. We would know about his fame as a teacher and also his uh, purported miracle working. We would know that many people thought of him as the Messiah or the Christ and that that title was attributed to him. We would know the time and manner of his execution, namely crucifixion under Pilate at a certain time. We would know that there was both Jewish and Roman cooperation in his death. And we would know that there were people who at least believed that they saw him after he was crucified, that he rose again from the dead. Now, beloved, that is the biblical story. Right? That is the basic, that is the skeleton. That's the skeleton of the New Testament. And we would know all of that if there was no New Testament. Are you letting the significance of that sort of sink in? Okay, so when, when we talk about who killed Jesus and did Jesus really live, we're not just talking about some figure that, you know, pie in the sky, by and by. I hope it was true. Oh, no, 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 no. This is rooted and grounded in sober historical fact. This is my summary. Jesus' death is well established by the what kind of evidence? By the historical evidence and is almost universally believed by both critical and sympathetic scholars. Right? Virtually no one denies that Jesus died at the hand of his detractors. When I say sympathetic and uh, uh, um, critical scholars, that is both people who are inclined to believe the story of Jesus and historians who really are indifferent to Jesus and his claims They're just critical scholars. They're just academic scholars evaluating the evidence. In other words, the point is basically everyone, Christian and non-Christian, affirms the basic truth. This guy lived. He died at the hands of his detractors under these circumstances in this place at about this time. So far, so good? Now, in addition to this amazing evidence, we're going to look at another evidence as we seek to answer the question, who was it that killed Jesus? And there are many possible answers to the question. You could say it was Rome. Rome killed Jesus, and there would be an element of truth to that. You could say Pontius Pilate executed Jesus, and there would be an element of truth to that. You could say the Jewish leadership had a role to play, and there would be an element of truth even in that. Some people say, well, no, it was God. God placed Christ there and allowed him to, okay. And someone says, no, 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 it's another answer altogether. Now, what I want to try and show you is that all of these answers are partially right, but none of them is fully right. And I want to give you what I think the biblical answer is, but of course that's the punchline. And unlike in past presentations, I'm going to make you wait for this one. But you only have to wait about another 25 or or 30 minutes. Now, the, the Old Testament is filled with what are called prophecies. And prophecies are just basically a foretelling of a of a past or of a future event. And we're going to look at some prophecies in this afternoon. 
um, in our next sessions. But basically, a prophecy is not a prediction, like somebody predicting who's going to win the Super Bowl or the World Cup or some you know, election. No, 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 no. Prediction has the element of risk. It's, it's a guess. It's, you know, maybe, maybe not. But prophecy is not a prediction. A prophecy is a declaration by God about what will happen, not what might happen. And in the case of Messianic prophecies, these were prophecies about the Messiah. And uh, the, the Old Testament is filled with these Messianic prophecies. By some, count, by some counts, there are as many as a hundred Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And um, basically, these are just like little details. Sometimes they're like little incidental details, and other times they're really central to the identity and mission of the Messiah. They include things like his birthplace, where he would be born. And that prophecy is made, for example, in Micah chapter 5, and we find the fulfillment, the very fulfillment in Matthew chapter 2. Um, who his mother would be, that she would be, uh, uh, that she would be a virgin. And, and we find the prophecy in Isaiah 7 and the confirmation in Matthew. Which tribe he would come from, what family he would come from, uh, the time that he would come. We're going to get into that in just a second. His basic message from Isaiah and then the f uh, fulfillment of that in Luke, when he, in Luke chapter 4 where he actually quotes that Isaiah passage. His entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, his betrayal and the price of his betrayal, that he would be spat upon, etc., other things. Um, that no bones would be broken in his execution, that he would be executed with criminals, that he would be mocked, that he would be ultimately resurrected, and, and the timing of his death. I want to spend time on that, that prophecy there from Daniel chapter 9. Basically what we have is a series of, of little details. That's kind of a cool way to think about it. Like, like these prophets are writing well in advance, in some case hundreds of years in advance about this coming Messiah. And in the case of Moses, more than a thousand years in advance. And uh, saying, okay, it'll be this, and 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 it'll be this. All sort of, um, you have this sort of composite, cumulative case that when the guy comes, we'll know who it is, right? Or we should know who it is. And it's very interesting, mathematicians... Um, have actually evaluated the chances, the statistical chances of one man fulfilling all of the Messianic prophecies, or, or even some have done just what are the chances of fulfilling eight, random eight of the prophecies, or, or 10, or 20, or 40, and the numbers are just astronomical. Uh, a, a man by the name of Peter Stoner wrote a book oh, a number of years ago, I think in the 1960s, called Science Speaks. And he estimated that the, the chances that one man could randomly, you know, just by happenstance, serendipitously fulfill these various Messianic prophecies, all of them, to 10 to the 157th power. Okay, so that's 10 with 157 zeros behind it. Now, let me just give you a feel for how big that number is. The total number of atoms in the universe is estimated by cosmologists and physicists at 10 to the 81st power. The total number of atoms in the whole universe, 10 to the 80th. And Stoner says, yeah, the chances, based on his calculations, um, yeah, the chances that one man would, you know, serendipitously fulfill, you know, all of these, whatever it was, you know, 96 uh, Messianic, I don't remember what his exact number, his calculation was based on, 10 to the 157th. In other words, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Even if you just take like 8 or 10 of them randomly, it's like 10 to the 17th power, which is an astronomically large number right? Well, the whole story that I want to tell here is actually from uh, one of the most amazing, I would say the most amazing of all the Messianic prophecies, and it's found in the book of Daniel. And I'm just going to turn there and uh, spend basically all of my time there, the rest of my time. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, and here we find a particular prophecy. The book of Daniel is filled with amazing prophecies. But in this case, in Daniel chapter 9, the latter part of Daniel chapter 9 contains a short prophecy, actually. It's just uh, one, two, three, four verses. Um, five if you include verse 23, and, or six if you include verses 22 as well, 22 and 23. So just a, f a few verses here. And uh, we're going to seek to try and understand these verses, but in order to really get our minds wrapped around them, we have to understand a basic biblical sequence. We have established that there's good historical and evidentiary reason to believe that, that Jesus lived, that he really was an historical figure that lived at about this time and did these things, etc. So we're on very solid ground here with the New Testament. We can feel good about the New Testament in terms of its historical accuracy. By the way, just a quick word on that. It used to be that, that some historians thought of Luke, uh, the gospel writer, as sort of you know an inexact and uncareful historian, when in reality... 
Confirmation after confirmation, archaeological and others, uh, other kinds of confirmations have confirmed, and point after point after point, the basic accuracy of Luke's perspective. And uh, in fact, he is now considered phenomenally reliable in his dates, his times, his geography, and his basic perspective. And you would expect that from someone who's identified in Scripture as a physician. You know, he's very precise when he writes, this was here, and this happened, and this person was in charge, and and people say, oh, yeah, 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 nice details, you know, work on it. You know, back, say, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Now, we know that Luke is fantastically historically accurate and is corroborated by biblical attest- extra-biblical attestation as well. Just an interesting little point there. Um, so it kind of all boils down to a basic sequence here, a basic sequence that was alluded to in one of the earlier extra-biblical things that we looked at. I think it was Mara Bar Serapion when he said, you know, what, why, did the, why did the Jews execute their wise king, the Jewish leadership execute their wise king? Because shortly after their kingdom was taken away, their city was destroyed. And this basic sequence is a huge part of understanding this particular messianic prophecy and under, understanding Jesus' identity in general. And, and very simply put, it boils down to the, the, the rejection of Jesus and his messianic identity by the Jewish leadership and the subsequent destruction of their city in A.D. 70. When Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70, according to this prophecy, it was actually a, an inevitable result, an inevitable consequence of the rejection of their own Messiah. Now, of course, not all the Jews rejected the Messiah. That's hardly the case because all of the New Testament, with the possible exception of Luke, was written by Jews. The early disciples were Jews. Most of the early believers were Jews. And so when people make really foolish, really blanket statements like the Jews rejected Jesus, they are completely mistaken and they're saying something that's frankly really stupid. The truth of the matter is, is that much of the Jewish leadership rejected Jesus' messianic identity, but all of Jesus' early believers were Jews. And later in the book of Acts, even many of those that had initially, the leadership, initially rejected Jesus, actually began to accept the evidences of his Messiahship after the outpouring of the Spirit. So I just want you to be very precise with your language, because frankly it's offensive to say the Jews rejected Jesus. Not only is it offensive, it's not true. It's not true. The Jewish leadership of the day rejected the messianic identity of Jesus, but later many of those people that initially rejected actually changed their mind. And again, just to restate my point here so it's uh, very clear, all of Jesus' early and initial followers were Jewish. So to make the statement that the Jews rejected Jesus is just a pure ignorant statement. It's unnecessarily offensive. We should say what actually happened. Historically speaking, the religious leaders of his day did not accept him as the promised Messiah, at least not initially most of them. So that being the case, what's described in Daniel chapter 9, and Jesus actually picks up on this in Matthew 21 and Matthew 24, is this basic sequence, and it goes like this. It's very simple. The Messiah would be largely rejected, and the city as a consequence would be destroyed. That's it. By the way, just a quick word on that. It doesn't say that God would destroy the city. No, but that the city as a consequence would be destroyed. God didn't destroy the city. The Romans destroyed the city. But because they had released themselves from God's protective power by rejecting the very Messiah that was sent to help them, God's hands were, as it were, tied. What more could he do, right? And so this is not a prophecy of something that God would do, but of something that would happen, and in fact it did. So get this basic sequence in your mind. According to this prophecy in Daniel 9 that we're going to spend time on, the Messiah would be largely rejected, right? And the city as a consequence would be destroyed. So that's the sequence. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Messiah rejected, city destroyed destroyed. By the way, John says this very same thing in the opening uh, chapter of his gospel. He says in John chapter 1 verse 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Right? The vast majority of people were initially resistant to Jesus' claims. But even those who did receive, again, were largely Jewish. And after the outpouring of the Spirit in the book of Acts, the number increased but initially it was like, no, this guy's not the guy, this guy's not, not the guy, etc. Especially among the leadership. So in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells a story. And uh, in this particular story, he says there was a man who had a vineyard, and he put a wine press in it, and he put a hedge about it, and he put a tower in it, and then he, he left it to some managers. And he said, okay, you guys, you know, this is my vineyard, but I'll come back at some point and want some of the fruits from the vineyard. Because it does take a long time. You plant a bunch of new vines for the vines to come to maturity and then to start to produce an, enough grapes, you know, so that you could actually harvest the grapes and maybe even make some juice from the grapes. So he says, okay, I'll be back at some time in the future to, you know, 
know, reap the benefits of my investment. And so, in order to sort of check up on his investment, according to Jesus in Matthew 21, he sends some people to go check it out, some servants. And uh, it says that when the servants came, the managers of the facility actually killed the servants. And then he sent more servants, and they killed them too. And, and the man, where, where are my servants? I, oh, so I hear they're being spitefully treated. Well, it was apparently a long distance, and he didn't have the time to go. So he sent his son, thinking, oh, my son will straighten this situation out. You know, I got some rebellious employees over there. But then according to Jesus' uh, parable, he said that when the son came, the managers of the vineyard, they said, oh, this is the son. If we kill him, we can take his inheritance. And so he was, the son was also killed like the servants that were sent before. And as Jesus is telling the story, he then asks the question of the religious leaders of his day. He says, okay, so when the owner returns, what's he going to do to those guys? Is he going to reward them for their good service? No. And then they respond and say, oh, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. And, and Jesus says, bingo, have you never read in your own scriptures the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then he says, Matthew 21, verse 43, I'll just quote it for you. He says, therefore, on the basis of your own judgment against yourself, he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. Right? So don't miss the basic sequence. The son would be rejected, and the people would receive destruction. So Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 has gone into the temple, Matthew chapter 23 actually, has gone into the temple for the last time and he has implored, he has pleaded, he has, he has just laid his heart out in, in total vulnerability and said, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would have no part of it. You were not willing. I mean, here we see, by the way, the picture of the character of God. God doesn't say, get over here, right? That's what we talked about in our last presentation. It's not the 10, you won't. It's the 10, you will be able to. You will no longer. It's the promises, not only duty and obligation. And so here we see God's heart on full display. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, you that kill the prophets. How often I wanted to gather you. Well, he could easily do it. He's God. He can do what he wants. He can get him by the scruff of the neck and make him come. But what, what, to what end? To what end? Because he's not trying to woo them in some slavery sense or some controlling sense. He wants to win them to, to not the strength of his nature, but the beauty of his character. Is that becoming a consistent theme here? And, and when you are trying to woo somebody to make their own decision to come and follow you, your hands are tied in terms of coercive force. So Jesus, you can feel the force here in Matthew chapter 23. You can read it. He's... Well, what can I do? And in, in despondency, the Bible says he left the temple. He left the temple. It's the last time he would ever set foot in the temple. The very temple that was designed to point to him, by the way. The lamb pointed to Jesus. The priesthood pointed to Jesus. All of the sacrifices pointed to Jesus. So just imagine the melancholy of that moment. Imagine the pregnancy of that moment. When, when Jesus leaves the temple for the last time, the very temple that was designed to point to him. And then he goes out on top of the Mount of Olives there in Matthew chapter 24. And the disciples come to try and cheer him up because this has been a rough go here in the temple. And they said, oh, Jesus, look at the temple. Look at how beautiful it is. It's cheer up. And he says, do you not see all these? This is Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 3. Do you not see all of these things? I tell you, verily I say unto you, not one stone will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. See, Jesus understood, and he understood it on the basis of this prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, that the Messiah would be rejected and then destruction would come. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Now, let's actually go read the prophecy. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people for your holy, and for your holy city. Okay, that's Jerusalem and Israel. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The short version of this verse is that God had extended his hand in covenant relationship over and over and over again to the Jewish nation, but that they had consistently rejected his overtures. They had been unfaithful to the covenant, and he basically says, okay, there's, we're not just going to do this forever. We're not going to go around the, you know, you know, the Mayberry bush forever, we're, we're, or Mulberry bush. We're going to... There's going to be an end to this. 
and 70 more weeks to accomplish, and he gives them a list of six things that need to be accomplished. I think I have those up here. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay. Then the prophecy comes, verses 25, 26, and 27, and I just need to spend a quick moment on this. The prophecy here is communicated in, in parallelism. And uh, what we mean by that is that unlike English poetry, which often hinges on rhyme and meter, like roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you, not all English poetry rhymes and has meter like that, but much of it does, Hebrew poetry hinges on what's called recapitulation, which is just to say something and then say it again, but with different words. So, for example, thy word is a... It's a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path, right? So saying the same thing, lamp to the feet, light to the path. Okay, that's, that's, that's Jewish recapitulation, and that's how poetry works, the Jewish poetry. And it can become very complex. It can, sometimes it's just A, B, A, B, but it can be even like A, B, C, A, B, C, and they can also have what's called a chiastic structure where it goes A, B, C, B, A. Right? Or A, B, C, D, C, B, A. And basically, that's the way that, that Hebrew poetry works. It works on the idea of recapitulation. Say something, then say it again, and then revisit it, revisit it, revisit it in parallel. Well, this prophecy is communicated poetically. In fact, if you're reading from the, the, the New King James Version like I am, um, verses 25, 26, and 27 are actually set in verse. They're not written like the rest of the chapter, which is prose. It's written like poetry. Do you see that? And uh, it's, it's written like poetry for good reason. And to really get your fingers wrapped around this verse, you have to read it in the A, B, A, B, A, B fashion. And we're going to do that here. Because I'm going to read it through the first time, and it's not going to probably make a whole lot of sense. I'll just read it right through. And then we'll go back and we'll read just the A parts, A, A, A. And then we'll read just the B parts, B, B, B. So let's just read it right through. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street will be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it will be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall make... Uh, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Okay, is that just clear as mud? Okay, part, if, if you're feeling like, man, that's not super clear, part of the reason for the lack of clarity is you're reading basically a prophecy about the Messiah and then the city, Messiah city, Messiah city, right? Messiah city, Messiah city, Messiah city. What I want to do now is just read the Messiah parts. So what we're going to do is going to read the first half of 25, the first half of 26, and the first half of 27. You tell me if it makes much better sense. You ready? We'll read just the A parts. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And he will confirm the covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Does that absolutely come alive? It's a complete piece of cake. It's totally easy to understand. And the same is true if we went through and read the B parts. If you go through and read the B parts, it's just about the city, the city, the city. Right? So it's, it's very easy to understand the prophecy when we read it. The A, the A, the A, the B, the B, the B. But for our purposes here, and we don't have time to go into every detail of it, it's very simple. Clearly what's happening here is the Messiah will come. The Messiah will confirm the covenant. He will be cut off, killed... He will, cause, uh, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, namely the sacrificial system, and as a result, the city will be destroyed by a flood of, of people that come in. A, a, some mysterious prince will come and will overrule the city with a flood. Not a literal flood of water, but a flood of people will destroy the city. So don't miss the sequence. To go back here, basically, Jesus said the Messiah would be rejected, the city would be destroyed when he told that parable. In Matthew 24, he said the Messiah will be rejected and the city will be destroyed. Well, that raises the question, where did he get this idea from? Did he just get it, you know? Did he just create it out of his brain? Did he just come up? No, no, no. He got this directly from the very prophecy that we just read. By the way, we know that because he actually says so in Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus is speaking about this very thing. He actually says, go back and read the book of Daniel. He says, I'll just quote it for you very quickly here, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. We just read that. That's Matthew chapter 9. He says, 
Let whoever reads understand. Let those that are in Judea flee to the mountains. So what Jesus is saying here is, I read Daniel chapters 7, 8, and 9, and I'm telling you that this is what it's pro- saying is going to happen. And what Jesus describes is that the Messiah will be rejected, and then the city will be destroyed by a flooding pagan power. That's exactly what happened in AD 70. But the precise details of the Messiah's experience are absolutely amazing. And we're just going to go through them kind of quickly here. First of all, he said that the time allotted for the Jewish nation was 70 weeks, or that is 490 prophetic years, or or, or literal years and prophetic days. And um, if you sort of just start doing the math here, we know that the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, because he says, from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, count 70 weeks. And uh, that command went forward in 457 B.C., 457 B.C., and uh, you can actually read about it in Ezra chapter 7, when the king, um, Artaxerxes, basically sent the Jews back to their homeland, sent them back to their homeland, and we have that date. It's very well established, 457 B.C. Well, if we count forward, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of count forward first the 69 weeks, because it says at the end of the 69 weeks, Messiah would come. And remarkably, in A.D. 27, this is exactly when Jesus came. And Luke the historian tells us this. If you want to go back and read Luke chapter 3, it's very interesting, and I'll just quickly read it for you here. I'm keeping my finger in Daniel 9. But listen to this. Listen to the precision with which Luke writes. I'm glad that we have the opportunity here to to have an example of this. Look at this. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his, Philip te- his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Do you see the precision here? I mean, he says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Right? We know when the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar is. It's A.D. 27. Right? It's absolutely an amazing prophecy, and this is just an example of how precise Luke is. Well, Luke says, in this year, a guy by the name of John came into the wilderness, and he started preaching, and then he started doing something that was kind of weird, a little wild, a little wacky. He started putting people under the water and bringing them up. So they said, man, look at this guy. He's like baptizing people. We'll call him John the Baptizer. Right? So John the Baptizer comes around, push, 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 and he's baptizing people, Right? And he's saying, I'm baptizing you with water, but someone is coming who will baptize you with fire. He's anticipating, he's announcing that someone else would come. And right there in Luke chapter 3, you also have this in Matthew and Mark, Jesus shows up and Jesus gets baptized. Now, when Jesus gets baptized, according to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and anoints him. Now, hear that language. The Holy Spirit comes upon him and anoints him. When the Holy Spirit anoints him, guess what he becomes? The anointed one. Well, how do you say anointed one in Greek? You say Christ. How do you say anointed one in Hebrew? Messiah or Mashiach, right? So it says 69 weeks, the Messiah will come, the anointed one will come, and Jesus is baptized baptized and anointed right on schedule. It's fascinating. And I, I wish I had time to even go into some of the other New Testament evidences that really undergird that. Well, then it says, but in the middle of the week, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Now, this is where things get absolutely mind-blowingly accurate. Because Jesus was, the original decree in 457 went forward in the fall of 457. And therefore, when Jesus is baptized, he's baptized in the fall of AD 27. Now, watch this. The fall of AD 28 would be a year. The fall of AD 29 would be two years. The fall of A.D. 30 would be three years. After fall comes winter and then spring. Jesus was crucified in the spring of A.D. 31. Exactly halfway through the remaining seventh year, the last seventh year. That's exactly what the prophecy says. In the middle of the week, he would be cut off, but not for himself. In other words, not because he had done anything wrong or criminal or deserving of death. He would be cut off, but not for himself. The final, three and a half, uh, the final three and a half years of the, of the covenant is confirmed. And according to the book of Acts, Stephen is stoned right at that time, A.D. 34. And then guess what? The gospel starts going to the Gentile peoples. In other words, the Jews' probation as a nation. Now, individual Jews, of course, can still be saved today, just like Jamaicans and Americans and Ukrainians and others. But as a nation, the Jewish privileged position as a nation at that point their probation was closed 70 weeks were determined the messiah had been rejected and the city was destroyed in AD 70 and Jesus said that's what would happen 
Now, I want you to appreciate the strength of this prophecy. We began by asking the question, did Jesus live? And we looked at excellent, a number of excellent extra-biblical historical attestations of the man Jesus that he actually lived. But man, what do you do with this prophecy? The prophecy of Daniel was given some almost 550 to 600 years before the time of Jesus. Now just let that sink in. Right? This is one of those many messianic prophecies that we talked about. And here we have a prophecy with such mathematical, historical precision that it's absolutely remarkable. By the way, when Jesus died on the cross, one of the things that it says is that the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Right? The veil that separated the holy from the most holy place in the sanctuary was torn from the top to the bottom. Now that veil was 30 feet tall, right? You have these tall curtains back here. If I was going to tear that tall curtain that's behind the screen here, the only way I could do it as a 5 foot 8 person would be to tear it from the bottom to the top. Right? I'd have to make a cut at the bottom and then I'd have to pull it. Probably two of us would get and we'd pull it. The tear would go from the bottom to the top. But, but the Gospels make a very significant point that when, when the veil was torn when Jesus died, it was rent from the top to the bottom. In other words, God did it. Right? God was the one that tore it. And what he was saying was, this sacrificial system is done. This sacrificial system is, is over because the true Lamb of God has come. The true sacrifice has come. That system is over. And so we see that this basic sequence is absolutely amazing. The Messiah would be rejected and the city would be destroyed. It was a prophecy. It was a parable. It was a promise. And it happened. First a prophecy, then a parable, then a promise, and it happened exactly. The most beautiful verse here, though, of course, is this verse, that the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Who, who was he cut off for? Well, the answer is for others, for the very people that he'd come to save. And this gets us right to our question, who killed Jesus? Was it Rome? Was it Pilate? Was the Jewish leadership? Who killed Jesus? And the answer is, the, the remarkable answer, I'll just let Jesus answer it. Jesus in John chapter 10 says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Watch how many times he's going to say that. Watch how many times he's going to make that point. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. John 10, 15 to 18. Four times he says in these, in these four verses, four times he says... I lay my life down. I lay my life. I lay my life. Nobody's taken my life from me. Rome couldn't kill the Messiah. The religious leaders couldn't kill the Messiah. How are, you how are you going to go about killing God's Christ? You can't. Jesus says, no one takes my life. I lay it down. I lay my life down. So, in a strange twist of fate, the answer to the question, who killed Jesus, is we did. Our sin and our rebellion and our obstinacy, the human race's obstinacy, so endeared us to the heart of God, so endeared us to Him, that He laid His life down for us. He was under no compulsion to do so. He was under no requirement to do so. He chose to lay his life down. And do you know why he did that? Because he loves us. Do you know why the Father allowed it to happen? Because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. If you believe this, believe this, that whoever believes would not perish, but have everlasting life. 